Hi everyone and welcome back to the Retro Shack. As many of you may know, back in the day I was the proud owner of an Atari 520 STFM for a couple of years before bowing to peer pressure and moving to an Amiga 500. My friend had one of those and he had all the games too which gave me an instant collection to borrow from, something I didn't have with the Atari. One of the things that was becoming evident even back then was that with more advanced hardware, more memory and greater performance, accompanying software titles had also gotten much bigger. It seems that whatever the media has been throughout computing history, and whatever the storage limits of that media have been, software designers have always found a way to span more than one of them. From multi-cassette games, to multiple floppy games, and even today with multiple Blu-ray disc games. The dreaded insert disc X message on the screen was just something that you had to put up with at the expense of your sanity. Anyone who's played Monkey Island 2 spanning 11 floppies on a single drive Amiga will understand completely. If you, like many businesses and many, many recording artists, used your Atari ST for anything serious, you really needed a hard disk solution for your beloved machine. But Atari, being Atari, well, they didn't make it easy or cheap to get one. Here at the Shack, we'd like to give a huge thank you to the sponsor for this video, PCB Way. They help us out with all of our PCB fabrication needs and make fantastic boards at amazingly competitive prices. And it's not only PCBs that are on the menu. Apart from other fabrication services like CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection moulding, PCB Way also have a great projects library of cool stuff to build from people all around the world. Oh, and if you don't like waving a soldering iron about, they can even assemble your PCBs for you. That's the PCB way. Right, on with the show. At the launch of the Atari ST in 1985, hard disks just weren't a thing for the average home computer user. They were exotic, expensive and unattainable to the general public. And if you did get one for your particular machine, there was no guarantee that you'd be able to use it on another computer brand or model, should you change or upgrade your machine. Because there were no real concrete standards of how to implement the various aspects of the media, such as the physical interface, the format of the media and the machine's inherent ability to access and use these devices. Bearing in mind that in those days, the operating system for a computer was in ROM and for the most part wasn't upgraded from the point of purchase. So whilst hard disks for the Atari ST did exist, you didn't really see them in the wild. Maybe in your workplace or your school or college, maybe in a store, but in a home, not so much. Two of the more common examples were this official Atari hard disk, which would have cost you $799 for 20 megabytes of storage. Now that's the same price that the Atari ST itself was when it launched. Alternatively, there was this Supra drive, which came in a range of sizes and prices, 20 megabytes for 799, 30 meg for 999, and 60 meg for a whopping $2,000. This particular hard disk unit from Third Coast Technologies, which was designed for use with the Atari ACSI interface, contains a 50 meg drive. This would have cost you the equivalent of the GDP of a small European country, and it weighs about the same too. So in the case of this Third Coast Technologies drive, just what exactly did you get for your money inside this massive steel case? Well, there's the hard disk itself, of course, and we'll take a look at that in a moment, and it appears to be a standard SCSI unit. Over here, we've got the interface card, which is responsible for translating the ACSI Atari protocol to the SCSI protocol that the drive understands. This is an Advantage Plus ST card from ICD, and it appears to have a battery, probably for a real-time clock feature. On the rear of the card are the ACSI ports for daisy chaining devices together in the same way that the Atari 8-bit series did with their ACSI ports. Take a look at the Fujinet episode linked on the screen for more about that. A quick Google search shows us that the Advantage Plus does in fact have that real-time clock and more importantly should work with any SCSI device, including a CD-ROM. 
I'll keep that in mind for future episodes as I don't recall ever seeing an Atari ST CD-ROM game or program. Please put it in the comments if you know of any. Now onto the drive itself, and it appears I was incorrect about the size of this drive. This isn't a paltry 50 meg drive, this is a Seagate ST296N with a whopping 96 megabyte capacity, or 85 meg usable when formatted. This is a significantly chunky piece of kit, and unfortunately it's totally dead, so I'm presuming has had some impact damage at some point in the past. Looking at the stats of the drive, we can see that it has a data transfer rate of around 1 to 1.5 megabytes per second, which is pretty fast for the time, although when we compare that to a new M2 NVMe SSD drive, it's clear how far storage technology has advanced in speed as well as in size. This huge empty space over here is where the equally massive standard PC power supply was. Ok, so we know now what our choices were for ST hard drives back in the day, but what about today? Surely there are modern solutions. Well yes, there are and there have been for a while. Today we're going to be looking at one that combines everything we've looked at that makes up an Atari hard drive solution, the power supply, the storage medium and the interface itself, and well, makes it this big. This is an ACSI to STM hard disk emulation project based on the STM32 microcontroller. This microcontroller is one of a series of 32-bit ARM CPUs ranging from 24 to 480 MHz and packaged to include static RAM and flash memory so nicely self-contained. Now that makes these little chips remarkably useful because not only are they powerful, far more so in fact than the whole of this Atari STE in the first place, but they are ridiculously cheap too. You can get an STM32 dev board and programming interface for just over a pound, or in dollars, well, just over a dollar at today's crazy exchange rates. The ACSI to STM kit takes the low cost and high power of these microcontrollers to act as the ACSI interface and rather than a huge SCSI drive on the end, there's an SD card slot. This one comes with a preloaded SD card complete with a couple of hard drive partitions, but if yours doesn't, there are pre-built images to download available on the net. Alternatively, you can start with a blank SD card, get hold of some Atari hard disk drivers and start from scratch. The interesting thing to note is that the TOS operating system in the Atari has virtually no support for hard disks other than looking for a master boot record, so your choice of drivers is completely up to you. We'll be testing this on our 4 meg Atari STE, so let's plug it all in and take a look at how it operates. The connection to the ACSI port on this particular unit is a cut down DB25 connector. The ACSI is a DB19 and it's considered obsolete these days and you'll often find aftermarket Amiga video cables using the same cut down DB25 approach. A separate 5 volt power supply is required to power the unit and this is important as even with this device you do need to power it up and let it run for a few seconds before switching the Atari itself on. Ok, we're all plugged in so let's power up the machine and keep our fingers crossed. Hard to believe this is the very first time I've ever seen an Atari 16-bit machine boot from anything other than a floppy disk or to a gem desktop. So this is a good sign as the screen is telling us that the SD card has been located, that its size is 1 gig and that there are 3 partitions available on it. The default is C, but we can swap the boot partition to D or E, we'll continue with C as the default. And here's our gem desktop with a new addition, the hard disk icon for the C partition. By default the other partitions aren't visible, but we can add those to the desktop by going to options and then install devices, and our missing partitions also appear as hard drives on the desktop. To demonstrate just how handy this is when compared to floppy drives, let's 
pick a game that was always a bit of a nightmare because not only was the game itself on two floppies, you also had to have a separate floppy for your save games. And the game would often ask for a change of floppy at the most infuriating times, dragging you right out of the game. Now I know that there are hardcore ST fans and hardcore Amiga fans, and I've lived in both camps, but today, just as much as I did back in the day, I find the Atari gem environment to be slow and irritating in comparison with the Amiga Workbench. I remember when I got the Atari ST, I didn't get any software with it, no games or anything. I felt I'd taken a small step backwards from my Amstrad CPC because I couldn't do anything with this Atari. At least when my earlier 8-bit machines turned on, they were at a basic prompt and I could start using them. With the Atari, I had a few icons I could click on and I could mess about with the desktop colours. I was less than impressed. Anyway, with the game installed onto the hard disk, we can build our party, wander around the city, go in and out of buildings, all without that annoying and mood-killing change disk message. So is it worth adding a hard disk solution such as this to your Atari ST? Well, today with devices such as this coming in at under £40 pre-built from Tindy, I'd have to say you can't really lose on it. If you use your ST for anything serious, be it for business or for creativity, then you really may benefit. Even if all you want to do is have an easy way to load and play games that works a bit like WHD Load for the Amiga, then these devices could be just up your street. Remember though that the Atari itself isn't really hard disk savvy, so your experience with these may be changed through your choice of drivers. There are a range of these from commercial offerings under active development such as HD Driver with the latest version being released in August of this year and the driver from 8-bit chip info which had a version released in March this year. There are also free drivers out there and also the original AHDI driver from Atari. The granddaddy of all of these modern hard disk emulators appears to be Ultra Satan, but that comes in at nearly twice the price. If I can think of a good reason to get one and test it, I will do. But for now, this little device seems to do everything the Ultra Satan does. I think I'll also try and fix that physical hard drive and see what kind of performance increase a modern solution offers. Are we limited by the speed of the disk or the speed of the ACSI interface? it will be interesting to find out. In the meantime, I could do with some help from anyone out there in Atari land who has a hard disk replacement like this. What are the best drivers you found that work well, particularly with this AC SI to STM unit? This is the constant enigma of working with retro machines. I always want to see them realize their full potential, even if I have no particular reason for doing so other than curiosity and love. So please leave comments below for both suggestions on drivers and settings, and I suppose also to games or software that really benefit from running on a hard disk. I'm tempted to give Atari Multitoss a go under the guise of FreeMint, an open source multitasking gem replacement that Atari realized the need for just that little bit too late, but which continues to be developed, so watch this space on that, as I'm keen to see what might have been and how it might have compared to the Amiga Workbench. I've been using this ACSI to STM now for a little while, and I've got to say that for under £40, it's a steal much faster at loading games than from floppy of course and i can honestly say that this combined with a modern modem replacement has got me in mind to actually set up and run an atari st bbs system just like i wanted to do when i was 18 but didn't have the money to do it let me know in the comments if there's any interest in me setting up a bbs anyway that's it for this episode Please like and subscribe to help the channel grow. YouTube algorithms are little hungry monsters and your clicks are their food. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time in the Retro Shack. Bye for now.